And Peter, I'm going to spotlight you and I'm going to turn it over to you. So I want to introduce Peter Hoja, who is our startup manufacturing program coordinator. Uh, Mike Reedlinger is our uh, on vacation right now. So we have some other folks that are helping out today. So we're looking forward to this session, hearing from um, Brian and his group at the New York State Science and Technology Law Center at Syracuse University. We're gonna talk about patent and IP 101 for startups. So I'm gonna turn this over to Peter. Uh, sure thing, thank you, Jackie. And uh, welcome everyone to the Scale Up Employment Tech Programs uh, Patent and IP 101 for Startups. Uh, first off, just as a reminder, if everyone could rename yourself to your full name with your organization, uh, for example, I'm Peter Hoja at Nextcorp. Uh, that would be very helpful for us in our reporting. Thank you. Give everyone a second to do that. Okay. And uh, first off, why are we here? Uh, to avert the climate crisis and build a sustainable future, not just for some, but for all. Uh, kind of a lofty, dramatic goal, but I think we're doing a good job so far uh, through our scale for climate tech and venture climate tech programs. Here is a list of some goals that we hope to stick to in New York State to reduce um, climate impacts, greenhouse gas emissions, and achieve more sustainable uh, energy. Hopefully, we stick to these in the future. Uh, and we're here for our scale for climate tech program. Uh, this program is for uh, early scale hardware startups that are looking to scale their manufacturing from prototypes to uh, full scale production. From what I've seen in the room, most of you should already be familiar, but if anyone isn't, please be sure to check out our website for more about the scale for climate tech program. And I will now yield the floor to Brian Gerling, director of the New York State Science and Technology Law Center at Syracuse University. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Peter. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Peter said, my name is Brian Gerling. I am the executive director here at the uh, New York State Science and Tech Law Center housed at Syracuse University. Uh, just kind of a, a run of show for the program today. We'll do some uh, introductions, uh, introduce you to some of our faculty and staff, uh, as well as our students who are really the, uh, uh, the entertainment here today, if you will. Um, and then we're gonna walk through the various forms of intellectual property that most startups uh, likely will encounter as you move uh, forward in the product development process. Um, so by way of background, a little bit about myself, uh, this program has been operated at Syracuse University now for almost 30 years. Uh, I actually was a student in this program uh, some 20 years ago now. Uh, so it's pretty cool that I am uh, now uh, running the program. Uh, after graduating law school, I moved to Washington DC, practiced down there primarily as a patent litigator uh, for almost 15 years, moved back home here to central New York, uh, consider myself a reform litigator. Uh, I practice primarily on the transactional side now, um, in addition to my uh, role here as the executive director of the Innovation Law Center and a member of the Syracuse University College of Law, Law faculty. Um, a little bit about what we do. Uh, I like to call what we do, uh, we provide due diligence reports. So what do I mean by that? Uh, we work with our clients who are primarily early stage technology companies to identify and capture uh, competitive advantages. So how do we do that? Two ways, one is from a legal standpoint, primarily that is, uh, patent protection, right? Because a patent provides you with an op a monopoly and uh, to exclude all others from practicing your technology. So a competitive advantage in the marketplace uh, is, is achieved from a legal standpoint through patent protection or these other forms of intellectual property that we'll talk about later today. On the other side, on the market side, we work with our uh, business school, our MBA students, and they do a market analysis around that technology. So what is the market for that? What are the barriers to entry to that market? Who are the potential licensing partners in that market? And we package that together 
uh, the market side and the legal uh, side and package that together in a comprehensive report that's about 20 to 30 pages long. Uh, and then we provide a, a presentation, a, a PowerPoint presentation, and we provide that to our client who then in turn can take that to a funder and say, look, here, I've de-risked my idea and here's why I'm a good investment risk because I've got a path towards patentability or if it looks like there's a lot of obstacles in that path, I've got freedom to operate, meaning I can still sell my product without running the risk of infringing upon an existing uh, a patent. Or there might be a speed to market strategy that, uh, that we've provided in our report. So our clients can take these to funders and say, look, here's why I'm a good, a good investment risk. So that, that's primarily what we do here at the Innovation Law Center. Um, without further ado, can I switch to the next slide that has our faculty on here? I'd like to introduce a couple of those. I don't think I have any more slides in this one. Okay. I'll have to share my screen for that. So while Brian's sharing that, I believe we've got a couple of our faculty members here, uh, one of whom was the general counsel at a uh, very successful medical device company, uh, Jack Rudnick, and another faculty member is Dom Dana, who was a prolific inventor at Paul Shallon. And I believe we have our program coordinator, Jessica Hotelling on here. So. Why don't we start with Jack? Hi, everybody. Um, I Brian took over for me. He's doing a great job. But what I, I didn't practice litigation. I practiced innovation at the company called Welsh Allen that did medical devices, but also created industrial divisions, invented barcode, and all kinds of things. So um, my experience is not so much in teaching, but in doing and try to impart that kind of practical experience to uh, the team that we have here. And, and Dom was one of my partners, actually one of our key engineers at Welsh Allen. And I think we're the only law school program in the country that has an engineer. And he knows as much about patent law as any patent attorney as well. So nice to be here. Dom? Well, yep. Yeah. Um, my name is uh, Dom Dana and I'm an adjunct faculty here at the Law Center. And I've been here, I think, seven years. And um, I came actually from a medical company, worked with Jack. Um, I was in research and development for many years. We uh, came up, it was a great company because we innovated. We had great uh, management that let the engineers and the people just invent things. So it was, it was a pretty entrepreneurial uh, company. So uh, my background is chemistry and electrical engineering. And uh, you know, it's great here working with the, uh, the law students. Okay. Jessica. Hi. It's like we have some, some, some echo problems there, but. Uh, Hi. Um, is that better? Hopefully now. Um, I'm the project coordinator at the Innovation Law Center. I'm fairly new, so um, I basically just run the social media and help um, hopefully connect people to the services they want at the Innovation Law Center. Thanks. And, and another, another reason why we brought Jessica on board is she's a, a former news reporter and uh, has a, a knack for storytelling. And so what we like to do here is now kind of capitalize on the, the successes that we've had with our clients and be able to tell that story. So uh, we're happy to have Jessica here. Uh, real quick, uh, two of our faculty that could not be here, Molly Zimmerman, she's the deputy director here at the Innovation Law Center, and also Dave Eilers, who is our MBA liaison. Uh, an adjunct here at the College of Law, as well as the Whitman uh, School. Now, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over, turn the page rather, and introduce uh, the stars of our show here, Claire Denny and Brian Harrison, who are both rising 3L law students here at the College of Law, uh, and that have come up through our program. 
Claire. Thank you so much, Brian. Oops, sounds like we've got echo issues too. Um, is that better? Um, thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, and thank you all for having us here today to speak about IP. Um, I am currently a 3L. I'm a senior research associate for the ILC and I'm working on a variety of projects uh, this summer and uh, this coming fall along with Brian Harrison. Thank you, Claire. I'm a third year law student as well. Um, just working on the various projects, uh, a lot of um, green energy technologies and it's been really interesting. I guess we will get started then yeah with that so now we'll uh okay so how we wanna, how we wanna <clears throat> so just one second Claire. how we want to structure the program is we'll walk through each top each individual form of intellectual property and at the end of that so for the, we'll start with patents first at the end of the patent segment if you have questions please uh enter those into the chat um or even as we're talking, enter them into the chat. We'd like to have this be uh, more interactive. Uh, and, and then we'll also take questions at the end, but if you have questions as we're discussing each form of IP, please uh, enter those into the chat. With that, take it away, Claire. Thank you again, Brian. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, so um, we will be discussing IP today. Um, let me just pull this up. So there are four different types of intellectual property. Uh, they are patents, trade secrets, copyrights, and trademarks. Each different type of IP has different requirements that must be met and offer different forms of protection. Uh, so we will first be discussing patents. Next slide, please. Uh, so patents are legal protections on new inventions. Under patent law, new inventions are generally defined as new things or new ways of doing things. Patents convey certain exclusive rights to the patent owner. Uh, so the patent owner has the sole right to make, use, sell, and import the patented invention. So if a patent owner finds that someone else is doing any of these things without their permission, the patent owner has the legal right to sue for patent infringement. However, there is a caveat to this. Patent rights are limited in geographic scope and in duration. So the exclusive rights granted by a US patent will only extend within the US. If a patent owner finds that someone is making and selling their patented invention in another country, they will likely not be able to sue them for patent infringement unless they have a patent in that country as well. If, however, the patent owner finds that their invention is being made in another country and then being imported to the US, they may be able, they may be able to sue for patent infringement. Uh, in addition, exclusive patent rights are also limited in duration. Uh, this duration is 20 years and begins on the date that the patent application was first filed. Uh, the reason for this stems back to the overall purpose of patent protection, which is actually written into the constitution. So first, legal protection for new inventions provides a necessary incentive for innovation. Most people would not invest time and effort into creating new things if anyone could steal and profit from their ideas without penalty. However, if legal protections on inventions lasted indefinitely, society would not be able to use, access, or improve upon new inventions. So in exchange for legal protection, Inventors are required to fully disclose their invention to the public when their patent is filed. After 20 years, exclusive patent rights terminate and the public will then be free to make, use, and sell the invention. So in some patents promote the progress of science by granting inventors exclusive rights for a limited amount of time in exchange for public disclosure of their inventions. Next slide, please. Um, oh, it looks like uh, we might have the wrong slide deck. Let's see. Yeah. 
I apologize for the technical difficulties. It looks like the wrong presentation was sent, but we're pulling up the correct one. So if you could just hang tight. So while we're waiting for the new presentation to come up, um, thank you for those of uh, those of you who just joined us. Uh, if you could take a moment and please rename yourself with your full name and your company, if it's applicable, that is very helpful for us to know who's here today. Thanks so much. Sorry again for the technical difficulties. Okay, um, so with that, there are three different types of patents. Um, those are utility patents, design patents, and plant patents. Utility patents are by far the most common. Uh, they protect new and useful machines, compositions of matter, processes, and articles of manufacture. Design patents and plant patents are more of the non-traditional or specialty patents. Uh, design patents protect the ornamental design of an article of manufacture, such as the overall look of the iPhone um, as displayed on the slide. And then plant patents protect new and distinct plant varieties, including hybrids. Uh, next slide, please. So when a patent is submitted to the USPTO or the US Patent and Trademark Office, uh, a patent examiner will determine whether all five uh, statutory requirements for patentability have been met. This process is referred to as patent prosecution. And after patent prosecution, if the examiner determines that these requirements have been met, a patent will be issued. So first, patentable subject matter. Next slide, please. Um, so patent, patentable subject matter basically asks whether the thing uh, you're trying to patent is actually eligible uh, for protection. So in general, a new and useful invention to be protected by patent must be either a machine, an article of manufacture, a new composition of matter, or a new method or process. Um, in the context of a wheelbarrow, for example, uh, the, the wheelbarrow itself could be protected as a machine. Um, the red base in there depicted in the photo could be protected as an article of manufacture. Uh, the plastic polymer making up that plastic basin could be protected as a chemical composition of matter. And the overall process of using the wheelbarrow to move uh, materials from one location to another could be protected as a process. Uh, things that are generally not eligible for patent protection are abstract ideas, mathematical equations and algorithms, natural phenomena, and laws of nature. Next slide, please. So in addition to patent eligible subject matter, uh, the patent or the invention must okay. actually be useful. It must provide some functional purpose. So here I have a patent figure showing the overall process of producing the chemicals used to make paint. So this process is useful because it creates um, a useful end product. Uh, here we also have a paint brush. This is a useful article of manufacture that can be used to create paintings. Whereas finally, we have the Mona Lisa, and although it is lovely, it cannot be protected by patent protection. Um, it is a creative expression and therefore does not serve some functional purpose. Next slide, please. The next two requirements for patentability are novelty and non-obviousness. Um, essentially, these requirements are asking whether your invention is new, and whether your invention is readily apparent to others in that area of expertise. Next slide, please. So in order to determine whether a technology will satisfy these requirements, the examiner will compare the technology against existing prior art. 
uh, in patent law, prior art is any evidence that your invention was already publicly known or available anywhere in the world before the date that your patent application is filed. Prior art includes patents, published patent applications, and certain public disclosures like journal articles and dissertations. So in evaluating the novelty requirement, the patent examiner is essentially asking whether your invention was actually new at the time it was filed. To make this determination, the examiner will begin by searching for prior art that existed before the application date. If the examiner finds a prior art reference that has identical claims and that existed before the application filing date, the invention cannot be patented because it is not novel. Um, it's important to note that some of the most harmful prior art can actually be the inventor's own disclosures. Uh, so if an inventor releases a publication about the invention before filing a patent application, this publication could potentially be used as prior art and can potentially destroy the novelty requirement for patentability. Um, luckily, the US does allow a one year grace period for disclosures made by the inventor. So in the event uh, that an inventor releases a publication on the invention, the inventor has one year from the time of disclosure to file an application. After a year passes, uh, that publication becomes prior art and can actually destroy claims of novelty. Um, it's also important to note that the US patent system is a first to file system. Um, in a first to file system, the right to, the right to the grant of a patent for a new invention is given to the first person to file an application for that invention, regardless of the date of actual invention. Uh, this is why it's important to file a patent application as soon as possible. So if someone comes up with the same idea for an invention and files an application for that invention before you do, it doesn't matter if you actually invented it first. The other person has established priority to a potential patent by filing their application before you did. Um, now moving on to non-obviousness, uh, if the examiner determines that the invention is in fact novel, then they will evaluate whether the invention is obvious. The examiner, the examiner essentially asks, based upon all prior art available at the time of filing, would the invention be obvious to someone with the same expertise? So if the examiner finds that the invention is an obvious variation or combination of existing things, the invention will be deemed obvious and cannot be patented. And finally, next slide please. Uh, the written description requirement. This is the final requirement for patentability and it depends solely on the patent application itself. Um, this goes back to the overall purpose for patent protection. So in return for patent protection and exclusive rights, inventors agree to reveal all the technical information about their invention to the public. So to satisfy this requirement, the application must fully describe the invention in full, clear, concise, and exact terms. In addition, the description must be enabling. It must be detailed enough so that a person with the same expertise could actually make and use that invention. And it must disclose the best mode. Um, at the time of filing, an inventor will probably know of many different ways to make and use the invention. So to satisfy the written description requirement, the inventor needs to provide the best mode to make and use the invention in their application. Um, if all of these five requirements are met, a patent will be issued by the USPTO. Um, now, Brian will be discussing Michael Jackson. Thank you, Claire. Um, so yeah, Michael Jackson. So what we're gonna actually look at is an invention that Michael Jackson helped made, which allowed him to do his uh, iconic lean from the, the Smooth Criminal music video. And so we're gonna use this, um, excuse me, this application or this patent as to go through the anatomy of what a patent looks like. And so in the beginning of each patent, there's an administrative portion that gives some information. Not all of it is relevant to us right now, 
And so, but the ones where is that is important, we'll look at it. Gives the name of the patent, gives the patent number, the date of filing. It lists the inventors. So in this case, Michael Jackson, Michael Bush, and Dennis Tompkins, as well as the assignee or who owns the patent. Um, after that, there'll be an abstract similar to any academic paper. It's just a quick summary of what the, the invention does or claims to do. Often there are figures or drawings that will help illustrate to the reader what the patent is and how it looks like and how it works. There will also be a background section. This often is just some background of, of the invention. What was the problem that the inventor was trying to solve? It also will go into how to make and use the, the patent itself. But the part that we we're gonna focus on and is probably the most important is the claims. So the claims define exactly what is protected by the patent. And it is what allows others to, what allows you to exclude others from making, using, selling, or importing into the, the US. Um, a way to, to visualize this, if you own a piece of property, you'll have a piece of paper called a deed, and that will tell you exactly the borders of, of your land. In a similar fashion, the claims of your patent do the same thing. It is the area that you can protect. And anything that's not in your claims, you're not able to exclude others from making, using, or selling. And so it's important that these claims are drafted properly and, and well. And ideally, you want them to be drafted broadly so that way you can have as much protection with your patent as possible. But if it's too broad, then the patent examiner may find it to be obvious or not novel. And so this is important to get it correct. And so we'll look briefly at an uh, example of a, a claim here. This was actually drafted by some students here for a patent drafting competition. And so you'll notice um, it's very particular, but there are several elements in this. In this case, it's a harness have, comprising a vest, a detachable pannier, a power source, and a remote communication unit. And so these elements are what have to meet the novelty and the non-obvious requirements that Claire was just describing. And, and so again, we, you're trying to get it as broad as possible. So that way you can get as much protection as possible, but not too broad. And so it's this back and forth with the patent attorney and the patent examiner that is why it often can be ex expensive to obtain a patent. Another thing that's to look at with patents is inventorship. So if we, we look back, remember back to the, the patent we were just looking at, it was my, the inventors were Michael Jackson, Michael Bush, and Dennis Tompkins. So what did these three men have to do to be considered inventors and no one else? Um, all three of them had to contribute to the conception of the idea and the reduction to practice. And so if there was someone else who helped with the conception but did not help with with reducing it to practice, then they would not be considered an inventor. And this is important because you're not able to patent anything that you didn't claim, or you can't include anyone on the patent who is not an inventor. And if your, your application is found to have someone who should or shouldn't be on there, your application could potentially be invalidated. Okay, and so now we're going to switch gears a bit. We've kind of looked at what are the statutory requirements of a patent, how a patent kind of looks. Now we're going to look at more of the, the process of obtaining a patent. And so the, the first step is kind of coming up with an idea and reducing that to practice. Once you, you have that pretty well set, you're able to file with the, the USPTO. When you file, you'll obtain a filing date. And this is the date in which if the patent is granted, you can enforce your rights to exclude others from making, using, or selling. And so the, this filing date is, is very important. Once you have that date and it's filed, you enter the prosecution phase. And so this is a process where you go back and forth between the examiner at the USPTO and the patent agent. And you're, you're going back and forth trying to get the, to define the, the, the claims where they're not novel or not, obvious or and that they're novel once if the patent is granted then you will be issued the patent and you'll be able to enforce your rights and so there are two type of applications the first one is a provisional this is a quick one it's less expensive than the full non-provisional application and this is 
important because as Claire mentioned, the US is a first to file system. And so with the quicker provisional application, you're able to potentially get an earlier date and potentially um, enforce your rights uh, sooner. With your provisional, you have a one year time period to um, fill out the full non-provisional application. And so the non-provisional, this is the one that will be prosecuted with the patent examiner. Um, and because of the back and forth, it may be expensive because it may take some time um, to, to, to prosecute. Um, just looking at an example, this is a history of interactions between a patent attorney and a patent examiner at the USPTO. And you'll see at the bottom, it started in 2011 when they received the application. And then eventually it was abandoned in 2015. Um, so it took four years. So on average, it takes about three years to, to prosecute an application. Okay, and so if you, you obtain a, a patent, the duration again is for 20 years from the earliest filing date. Um, but that, that's not the end of the line once you obtain your patent, that there are other things that must be done. One of which is that there are periodic maintenance fees that need to be paid. Um, and they get become more expensive over time. And this is to encourage the dedication of any patents that aren't being used to the public. So that way we can improve and, and encourage the development of science and technology in the United States. But also you need to um, police your own patent that um, you have to understand what your competitors are doing. There are no patent police out there ensuring that your competitors are not infringing upon your patent. That's something that you need to, to take care of. And a, a competitor's response to your obtaining a patent is that they may challenge the validity of the patent because they're gonna want to not be excluded from that space or excluded from making a similar device and compete. And um, that is our patent section. So were there any questions Okay, if not, then I will pass it back to Claire for trade secrets. Just, just one quick point before we move on to trade secrets. So one of the ways uh, that uh, provisional applications uh, can be uh, very useful, particularly for early stage technology companies, is a lot of times you go out seeking funding and most of those funders will not sign uh, non-disclosure agreements. Uh, so you have to reveal your technology to the potential funder without any types of protection. Uh, where a provisional patent application comes uh, rather handy is that if you have a provisional patent application on file, you then uh, have, have, a, have a certain level of protection and you can go and talk to these funders uh, without running the risk of a non-disclosure or not having a non-disclosure agreement, um, and then ta them taking your idea and trying to uh, essentially, uh, you know, rip you off. You've got a patent on file, you'll have some recourse down the road, but at least there's some level of protection there through filing of a provisional patent application um, when you're going to go talk to a funder. Uh, the other thing is, is if you are publishing a paper, if you're uh, talking at a seminar uh, about your technology and you disclose how to make and use that particular technology in the U.S., and I know we have some international folks here, but in the U.S., and this is U.S. focused, our, our talk here today, in the U.S., you have one year from that public disclosure in which to file a patent application at the USPTO. If you do not do that, the law, the government deems that you have dedicated that technology to the public and you no longer have any rights to uh, seek patent protection on that particular technology. So that's another way that a provisional application comes in handy. Um, if I've disclosed it, uh, you know, at a seminar or publicly disclosed it um, in an article, I can stop that clock from running uh, by going ahead and filing a provisional patent application with the PTO. I see we had a couple of other questions here. Aaron. 
Uh, hi, uh, thank you so much for this. Uh, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank you guys. And I have a question regarding the patent. I hope you're able to hear me clearly. So uh, when you're filing for a patent, if it's like a software, if it's something which is uh, a piece of like a, a code or is it more like a sequence, does it fall under like, is it a tool, which is like a brush or a tool which you use, or would you go like the process map? Do we need to put the software as processing out there and put the process mapping it out there and put it as a, a system like that? Or do we like need to consider that as a tool or a piece of art? Or how is like a specific software or a particular product which you make? How would you put classify that in the patent section? That's what I was. Sure, sure. And I got to throw this caveat out. We don't practice law here at the Innovation Law Center. Uh, even though I'm a licensed attorney, this this is not constant. This does not constitute legal advice. But that's a that's a great question. Uh, I think the easiest way to think about it is right. So mathematical equations are not patent eligible subject matter. So the way to think of it is, you know, object code, source code, and then kind of the software architecture where you're actually uh, the program's actually performing a function. The object code, the source code in and of itself is not patent eligible subject matter. Uh, where you get on the continuum in that in those steps from object to source to software architecture, when you get to that software architecture realm, you know, the, the software, the program is actually performing some function. That's where you get into get over the hurdle and now you're into the realm of patent eligible subject matter. So you'll have a flow chart and your dot and your figures on the patent about how the process works. Um, and, and that's what you'll be getting is a process patent um, or a method for doing something. So those are kind of the, the steps that you need to be cognizant of as you move towards or if you want to seek patent protection around either code or algorithms uh, and then moving into the realm of software. Does that answer your question? Okay, so in the early stage, uh, yeah, it does. Uh, so if I'm not, if I'm getting it right, so in the early stages, we need to be very concentrated on what is out. And only after you move from the source to the product development or prototype testing, that's when we would be mostly involved in like filing for a provisional application for a patent or getting the process uh, patent for that. So if I'm not, if I'm reiterating it. That's, that's mostly correct, yes. Now, as you'll see in a minute, when we move into trade secrets, another way to protect the source code or the object code or the algorithm is through a trade secret. And we'll see in a minute, that's what Google's done um, in many other companies. So uh, before we move on to trade secret though, are there any other questions? I don't see any other hands up, but. Hi. Sure. Okay, um, so I have a question regarding the uh, patent ownership. So um, I'm a grad student and uh, like many, some of the research that I do in, as part of my PhD, and uh, uh, we think that this, uh, like a, some of these could be patentable and could be IP or could be uh, turned into a business ventures. So um, uh, could you give us some ideas like how does this work with the university? Do they, uh, if we file a patent for that, do the university own the uh, intellectual property or could we sh make sh some kind of like sharing arrangement or how does it work? I'm completely new to this area. So anything will be help helpful. Uh, yeah, I mean, and typically that's, if you're a grad student level, and above, uh, you'll generally have some form of employment arrangement with the university. And within that agreement, in all likelihood, what it says is, and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, just putting it in, in simple terms here, anything you invent on our time or using our lab or using our resources uh, will be owned by the university. So while you may be the inventor on the patent, you would then under your employment agreement have to assign your rights to that patent over to the university. And that's typically involves the technology transfer office. Uh, you likely would file an invention disclosure statement um, as your research is uh, getting underway and progressing with the tech transfer office. 
Every tra tech transfer office is different at different universities. Um, you know, and then there's other ways that if you as the inventor, you want to start your own company, you may then, uh, you know, seek to license back your technology from the university so you can go and exploit it and commercialize, commercially exploit it. Um, so there's various different ways to handle that, but just uh, from a general framework, just keep in mind that generally speaking, uh, what you invent on the university time or using the university resources is going to be owned by the university. Thank you. Okay, there was a couple other in the chat here. What happens after the one year provisional expires, but you haven't officially applied? Okay, so uh, the provisional applications are secret. So once you file it and then you don't go ahead and you and file an additional or a non-provisional application, that provisional just ceases to exist um, and you can refile a new provisional. Um, you know, the, the question is going to be whether or not at some point down the road, if, if a competitor, you go to assert your rights against a competitor, uh, that competitor may uh, uncover that and try to find a way that uh, the previous um, filing or there was some other form of public disclosure that you had in, during that window. Um, so it, it, it's, there are some risks associated with that that you know, are a little too specific to get into here, but uh, generally speaking, if provisional applications are are secret. They're they're not published, unlike a, a non-provisional application or a full-blown patent application in the U.S. that is published after 18 months of filing. So that then becomes once it's published, it can be, and you were to abandon that application and then try to go on and file a patent on that particular technology later on because it's published, it's going to be used as prior art against you. Uh, so you can be your own prior, you can uh, be your own prior art against yourself. So that's, that's something to be aware of and to consult with your patent attorney about. Um, it's like what percentage of patent filings are successful? Peter jumped in on that. Thank you, Peter. Um, and I think, I think that was the last question in the chat. Any other questions around patents before we move on to trade secrets? I think we're good. Yeah. All right. Oh. Okay. Um, so trade secrets. Trade secrets are a form of legal protection for any information or process that derives economic value from being confidential. For a trade secret to be legally enforceable in the United States, the trade secret must contain information in some form, it must derive independent economic value from being kept secret, and the owner must actually take reasonable efforts to maintain secrecy. Trade secrets offer a few unique advantages uh, they can be used to protect a wide variety of subject matter so long as the information is confidential. So, for example, trade secrets are often used to protect things like algorithms, formulas, uh, business and information, and certain aspects of software that would otherwise be ineligible for uh, patent protection. In addition, unlike all other forms of IP, Trade secret protection is not limited to an allotted amount of time. Protection can exist for as long as the secret remains confidential. So even though trade secrets do not convey exclusive rights, they allow you to protect information by holding others liable for misappropriation. Next slide, please. So it's important to understand first what appropriate misappropriation is not. So misappropriation is not reverse engineering and it is not independent lawful creation. So if you have an idea or an invention protected by trade secret, 
and someone is able to reverse engineer it or someone creates it independently and then begins selling it, you cannot sue them for misappropriation. Um, however, misappropriation is the unauthorized disclosure of a trade secret, the unauthorized use or uh, procurement through unlawful means, so essentially stealing or hacking. Um, in these cases, the trade secret owner would be able to recover damages uh, for misappropriation of their trade secret. Um, and in order to establish a legal claim for misappropriation, the trade secret owner actually has to prove that they took reasonable measures to protect their trade secret. Um, the easiest way to do this is by implementing NDAs. Uh, next slide, please. So NDAs are non-disclosure agreements. Um, they are absolutely essential to trade secret protection and should be um, enforced generous, generously. Um, who should sign one? Sim the simple answer is anyone and everyone who comes across your confidential information. In addition, the agreement should be for an indefinite duration. Uh, it wouldn't make sense to bind someone to keep your information confidential for a period of 10 years uh, if your trade secret can potentially be protected indefinitely. Um, so the duration is another key aspect of the NDA uh, for trade secret protection. Next slide. In addition to NDAs or confidentiality agreements, uh, trade secret owners should also utilize confidential notices. Uh, this is a very simple way to protect trade secrets. Confidential notices are essentially just a notice of confidential information on a document or an email, for example. Um, and they put third parties on notices uh, or on notice that information is protected as confidential. So in the event that a third party discloses or disseminates that information, you may be able to hold them liable for misappropriation, even though uh, you may not have directly supplied them with that information. Uh, in addition to notices, you should also implement restricted access. You should limit your dissemination generally and utilize things such as encryption or um, you know, hardware locks and things like that. Next slide. So here are some famous examples of trade secrets today. Uh, as Brian mentioned earlier, the Google algorithm is one notorious uh, trade secret, uh, as well as the New York Times bestseller list. In addition, things like the Coca-Cola formula and the chemical composition of WD-40 are also protected by trade secret. Um, does anyone have any questions about trade secrets? If not, if not, we will be moving on to copyright. Just, just real quick before we move on to copyright. So I, I think a, a good way conceptually to think about the differences between patent and, and trade secret you know, we've already identified the patent eligible subject matter and the reasons why you may want to uh, use a trade secret on a mathematical equation or an algorithm. Um, so under the patent system, as Claire talked about earlier, you need to basically teach in the body of your patent uh, how to make and use your invention uh, so that someone skilled in the art can read your patent and actually make the invention that you are, are claiming uh, rights to. And so that, and, and the reason for that is for the advancement of the useful art and sciences. We want, for lack of a better term, we want people to make better mousetraps, right? Be able to read the patent and then make a better technology. Now they can't infringe upon your patent because you've got a monopoly to practice that technology for 20 years. Contrast that with a trade secret, which is you're not telling anybody how to make it. In fact, you're trying to maintain it and keep it as a secret. So any employee within your company, you have them subject to non-disclosure and confidentiality agreements so that nobody is, is teaching or disclosing to third parties how to make and use that particular technology. Um, the risk you run, however, with a trade secret is, is 
if someone can reverse engineer, they can take your technology or what your trade secret protected technology. And if they can reverse engineer it and they can make and use it and they haven't misappropriated, they haven't gotten any um, um, you know, unlawful information and they've just gone ahead and reversed engineer it, uh, that's, then that's no longer a trade secret. So that's kind of the risk you run, which is doesn't cost much to get a trade secret. It's on unlimited duration, as long as you're continuing to sell that particular product. The risk, however, is unlike a patent where someone, you're teaching people how to make and use your invention, they can't practice your invention because you've got that covered by a patent. They would need to seek a license from you in order to practice that technology. So they, they can't reverse engineer the same exact technology. On the other hand, with a trade secret, if they can figure out how to reverse engineer it and make it, uh, then your trade secret is no longer valid and you don't have any rights to that particular technology. Oftentimes, an IP strategy around using patents and trade secrets are, for example, you may want to get a patent on the end product, the uh, you know the product that you make, but then keep the method or the process of making that as a trade secret. Um, so that's the, there's a, there's a lot of different interplays between the different forms of intellectual property, and so it, it's it's generally helpful to consult with an attorney, you know, early on to say, okay, here's what we'd like, here's what we're making, here's what we'd like to, here's what our end game is, and kind of work with your IP attorney to develop a strategy around that for protecting, uh, using different forms of intellectual property to protect your technology. Any other questions on trade secrets? I don't see any hands and I don't see any questions in the chat. Okay, moving on to copyright. Thank you, Brian. So copyright. So we've seen up now, up to now, patents, they, they protect useful machines or processes. Trade secrets can protect um, things that do not meet the subject matter requirements of patents. Well, copyrights protect creative expression. And so there are three requirements for a copyright. It has to be original, a work of authorship, and fixed in a tangible medium. And when we say fixed in a tangible medium, what we mean is that it's recorded in some way, whether it's written down, or if it's a book, it's written or a poem, whether it's performed, if it's a play or a musical, it just has to be physically there. It can't just be an idea in your head or your imagination. It has to be recorded in some way. And so that's what we mean by that. For work of authorship, it could be one of several things, books, songs, uh, artwork, a statue, a musical, but it doesn't just have to be artistic things. It can also be, you know, more work related things like architectural works or blueprints. It can be certain aspects of software like original source code. It can be an academic paper, for example. For originality, it just has to be original or independently created. So you can't obtain copyright protection for something that already exists or someone has already created. Uh, this standard is akin or similar to the novelty standard with patents. And so there are th certain things that can't be protected under copyright law because of lack of originality. And some of these, for example, are words or short phrases, facts, ideas, theories, or hypotheses. hypotheses. Um, the, the intent of copyright is to protect creative expression. And if we're protecting the words like the and and or facts and theories, we may end up limiting people's creative expression or their chance to write and explore. Um, the, so the intent is that we're protecting the expression of ideas, not the ideas themselves. And so this is why we can have so many, several documentaries about World War II, because the, the facts of World War II, you can't obtain protection for, but, but you can obtain protection for how you express or how you show the facts. As well, copyright protection is starts at fixation or once you record it or write it down. Um, okay. 
And then the, the owner or the, the author of the work is the one who owns the copyright. Um, there is one exception of this is ca called the work made for hire. And this is a scenario where an employee in their appointment agreement uh, agrees that anything that they write or make is owned by the employer. Um, frequent examples of this are with universities, often grad students and researchers, professors, anything that they make or write is often owned by the university. Um, often in law, when we talk about property rights, we talk about, about a bundle of sticks. And each stick is a right that you're able to either exclude others or use to protect your, your property. And so for a copyright, it, you can get four uh, sticks or four rights. The first one is the right to reproduce your, your work. You're able to prepare derivative works. You're able to distribute copies and you're able to perform, display, or send your, your work. Um, each of these can be in, licensed independently. For example, artists often will license the right to sell their, their songs or their albums, but maintain the rights to perform their songs so they're able to tour. So copyrights do not need federal registration. However, if you want to file an infringement action against somebody, you need to have it federally registered. Once it is federally registered, you will receive the, the circle C after your, the name of the, the work, and that um, makes everyone aware that that work is copyrighted. There is an, uh, def a defense for uh, copyright infringement. Um, it is called the Fair Use Doctrine. It is a defense that allows um, the use of copyrighted materials for socially beneficial uses. For example, education or the news, anything that increases knowledge or parody, for example. Uh, were there any questions regarding uh, copyright? I don't see any and we are there was a hand raised. I oh, there was. Oh, hi, uh, Matt. How did assume? Masum. Assume. Yes. yes. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so it's just a. I am just curious about a general uh, thing. If you're aware of the recent uh, deep learning and machine learning advances, so uh, there's been a lot of like models who are uh, like a like a very big neural networks who have been shown to create video, like a original like content. Um, so you train it with existing existing data, like you train it, train it with a lot of human faces of, or a lot of paintings of Van Gogh, and it will be able to like create a new image in the style of Van Gogh or something like that. So um, are those, um, are, uh, do, the, do they come under the copyright protection if the um, uh, if, 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 if uh, like copyrighted items were used to train a neural network um, is that something uh, will that be a, an infringement or will, the, will that be a fair fair use Uh, I, I'll give you a very technical answer. It, it depends. The courts have not worked through these issues and interpretations of these new technologies compared with the copyright statute. Um, the only thing I can say is, for example, uh, you know, different codes are made publicly available out um, that that. Uh, coders can use and then and build separate code off of existing uh, publicly dedicated code. And in those cases, the, the person developing the software, the code off of that only gets rights to whatever they're adding to uh, that particular code, right? So the, the public portion of it, there are no rights to that. That's been dedicated to the public. The only rights they would have in in that would be, you know, to this to the additional code that they made, and then the function that maybe 
performing uh, off of that particular uh, code or, math or mathematical equations. In the context of fair use, uh, I guess it would depend largely on what the purpose of that would be. If it was for an educational use, uh, that may then fall under you know, one, of the, one of the fair use defenses. Um, it would be a different question though, if it was then being used for, uh, for commercial purposes. So I don't, I guess the, the, the answer is I don't have a great answer for you yet. It hasn't, hasn't worked its way through the courts yet. All right. All right. <laughs> we keep struggling with the whole mute thing over here. Sorry about that. Um, if there are no more questions about copyright, uh, I will go ahead and begin discussing trademarks. There is, there's one question in the chat to clarify. So, um, oh, did you see? There was, there was one question in the chat that wanted to know if the Star Wars oh, example was infringing or not. Is the Star Wars example infringement? Brian. Uh, the last slide, uh, it's the Starbucks one. Um, I'm actually not too sure on that one. So that <laughs> actually, that actually um, was provided as an example of parody. So parody is one uh, example of fair use of copyright uh, that would protect you from claims against infringement. I did not pull that from a case, I will admit. I thought it was funny and I thought it is a parody. So that does not come from a legal case. I cannot answer the question of whether or not that is infringement because I don't think that's become an issue. Um, but that is an example of parody, which is often considered fair use. Are there any other questions? Brian, I didn't know if you wanted to follow up on that at all. No, I, I have nothing, nothing further to add there. Moving on to trademarks. Okay, so trademarks. This is the final section of our slideshow and the final form of IP. Um, so trademarks are a type of intellectual property that identifies the source of a particular goods or service. They don't identify the product itself, they identify the brand owner. Um, trademarks can be used to protect distinct words, symbols, phrases, or designs, and can even be used to protect image and likeness in certain circumstances, so long as the mark identifies the source of the goods or services. Um, trademark protection establishes legal liability against others who infringe on your mark. This happens when another entity uses your mark in a way that confuses consumers about the actual origin or source of the goods or services. So although trademarks protect distinct marks, they really protect against unauthorized use of the goodwill and the reputation that you've built for your brand. Um, trademarks are associated by a combination of common law and federal law. And although federal registration is not required for protection, it is highly recommended. This is because when a, fade, when a trademark is federally registered, the trademark owner can exclude others from using the mark on same or similar goods throughout the entire US. Whereas unregistered marks are only protected in the geographic area where the mark is used. In order to obtain trademark protection, the mark must actually be used in commerce uh, in association with the sale of goods or services, and it must be distinctive. Next slide. So a mark's distinctiveness affects whether it's protectable. Distinctiveness is all about how well a mark identifies a single source. If a mark cannot be associated with a single source of goods or services, it cannot be protected under trademark law. Distinctiveness is measured on a spectrum. Uh, so the most distinctive marks are the strongest and most eligible for protection, whereas non-distinct marks 
may be ineligible. Although non-distinct marks may be able to obtain trademark protection if they can demonstrate that they have acquired secondary meaning. So secondary meaning essentially means that consumers have come to associate a non-distinctive mark with a specific commercial source. Demonstrating that a mark has acquired secondary meaning can be difficult and often requires significant evidence in the form of testimonies or surveys or extensive uh, marketing or sales of the product to show and demonstrate to the USPTO that secondary meaning has been established. So from a legal perspective, the strongest trademarks you can register are for arbitrary or fanciful marks. These marks are inherently distinctive because the mark does not have anything to do with the product itself. These are the marks that will pass through the USPTO the quickest because they are inherently distinctive. And again, they do not need to demonstrate uh, that they have acquired secondary meaning to be protected. So for example, um, Apple. Apple is very well associated with computers now, but an Apple itself has nothing to do with computers or computer software. This is an example of an arbitrary mark. In addition, um, the trademarks for Google and for Adidas also have nothing to do with their products because these words are entirely made up words. These are fanciful marks. Uh, Microsoft is a suggestive mark. So it's not the strongest mark, but it is still protectable. Unlike Apple or Google, Microsoft can be associated with its product because the name of the brand or the part of the name being soft suggests that it produces software. Suggestive marks are therefore not as strong as arbitrary or fanciful marks such as those of Google or Apple because they're not as distinct. And it would not be surprising if another software company incorporated soft or um, micro into their company name with the sale of computers or software. Um, next are descriptive marks. These are less distinct because they simply describe the product or service that is being sold. So American Airlines or Cartoon Network. Uh, in addition, these marks will require demonstration of secondary meaning in order to be protected. And finally, generic marks are often ineligible for trademark protection because they do not identify a single source of goods. Uh, sometimes people identify a mark so closely with their product that they actually substitute the name of the trademark for the product, as in Band-Aid. Uh, the mark therefore identifies the product itself instead of the brand or source. When this happens, the trademark becomes generic and legal rights will terminate. This is elaborated on a bit more in our video. The next slide. Um, Can you Brian, share it? Since you're sharing, if you, you have view options there, um, you have the option to share your audio. And you okay. can usually optimize for video sharing. Um, I'll st I know how to do it through st I'll reshare. Sorry, it's asking me for a password. Oh, it's, yeah, it's not allowing me to share. It's saying I have to install some Zoom audio I think we can. Well, I was going to say we, we can promise. probably skip the video for today, um, although it is very funny and very entertaining. Basically, just... 
Velcro was. Oh, go ahead, Brian. I was just going to say, we promised the audience entertainment. So, Brian and Claire, you can act out the Velcro video live here in person. Take it away. No, I, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, yeah, unfortunately, uh, it's not going to be able to play. So, I, I can't get it to go either. So, just uh, Claire, if you could just reiterate how a trademark can become generic. Sure. So the the video was all about Velcro. And uh, when I think of Velcro, the first thing that comes to mind is the actual product. So the, the what is it, hook and loop. <laughs> um, in reality, Velcro started out as the brand name of the company but their product became so well known that people began substituting the name of their company for the product itself. So then when other companies would produce the same product, there was no way to distinguish Velcro, their actual trademark name from the product itself. So this is what happens when trademarks become generic. And the end result is that trademark rights terminate and there can be no protection. Um, Brian, I didn't know if you wanted to elaborate on that a bit more. Yeah, just one other example of that for our friends in Rochester, uh, Xerox, right? So, uh, you know, the act of photocopying something, uh, the name in, in many office settings became, can you just Xerox that? So. Xerox was up against the same type of challenge, which is, you know, they became so popular that everyone recognized the name, uh, but you can become so popular that uh, you can end up losing your rights to it. So uh, that was a challenge for, for Xerox um, as well as Velcro. So uh, there are ways to combat that. And one of which was this video that Velcro put out uh, there's another element uh, or another brand of or category of marks, famous marks, which, um, you know, help combat against becoming generic as well. So. All right. Uh, and to wrap things up, we will just be talking about um, some other unique forms of trademark protection. So trademark can actually extend to protect colors, sounds, and scent. These are generally more difficult to obtain registration and trademark protection on. Um, you would have to demonstrate that the mark is a non-functional part of the product and that the mark actually identifies the source of the product. So one very famous example of a applicant who was successfully able to obtain trademark protection on a scent is the company Chanel. So Chanel number no. five uh, is actually protected, is a protect, protected scent under trademark law. Um, in addition, trademark law also can be used to protect celebrity image and likeness. Celebrities can bring false endorsement claims where their image or likeness is used to endorse a product without their permission. Uh, celebrities must be well known uh, to do this. And finally, next slide, trade dress. So trade dress is a subset of trademark. It protects the total image and overall appearance of a product. To obtain trade dress rights, the design must be non-functional and must have acquired secondary meaning such that the design is identifiable with the source. So here, on the slide, we have the Coca-Cola bottle. That is one famous example of trade dress. On the left of that, we have their traditional logo, their trademark. Uh, and again, at the bottom, we have the Louboutin shoe. The red bottom of the sole is a protected trade dress. So the total image and overall appearance of the red shoe or the red sole, excuse me, is protected by trade dress. Whereas again, to the left, the Louboutin uh, logo, the signature from Christian Louboutin is uh, protected as a trademark. Um, and that concludes our 
IP 101, if there are any additional questions, please feel free. I'm looking in the chat. Oh, Jackie, thank you. So Jackie put the link to the Velcro chat that's highly entertaining. So can view it at your leisure. Um, yeah, if any questions, either raise your hand or um, enter into the chat. I know we've gone over here. We apologize for that. Um, yeah. And uh, Brian, if uh, if folks do want to get a hold of you uh, for any questions after the session, is uh, how would you uh, prefer that they do that? Sure, I'll put my uh, email address in the chat there. Wonderful. So if folks do have questions. Once the session is finished, um, we have gone over. Appreciate those who hung out. Um, you know, it's a really valuable session. So feel free to email Brian directly if you have any other questions. Is there anything else that anyone would like to ask? Otherwise, um, I will thank you all and uh, we will we will finish up here. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for All your time. Right. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Take care.